Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. You're definitely in for it because I'm going to be reviewing an iconic teen romantic comedy and drama that came out on April 14, 1989, which is now celebrating its 30th anniversary. Simply called Say Anything. Right there, with John Cusack as Lloyd, who's an underachiever. He's actually holding up the iconic scene in the movie which is the boombox yeah, while well, the song In Your Eyes by Peter Gabriel is being played in the background and yeah, trying to get back to um, his love interest who's a valedictorian very smart, beautiful and intelligent named Diane yeah <laughs> who actually lives with an overprotective father named Jim who owns a retirement home yeah, yeah. and this was of course uh, the tutorial debut of writer Cameron Crowe who previously wrote uh, Fast Times at Richmond High and went on to become very success with other films that follow you know, such as uh, Jerry Maguire and Almost Famous come to mind and this is the 20th anniversary edition that came out in 2009 on Blu-ray, which actually had a lot of great features here on the back, as you can see. And yeah, so you got the uh, commentary by Cameron Crowe with John Cusack and Ioni Sky. For those who don't know, she was from the movie River's Edge. You know, with Keanu Reeves. Yeah, Dennis Hopper. Yeah, I know b before they went on to do Speed together. Yeah, hero and villain. Um, you also got Crispin Glover from Back to the Future to be in this, and among others. Um, and uh, you also got the iconic film Revisited, which is Say Anything 20 years later. Yeah, it's just a. Uh, just a 20 minute uh, documentary or 21 per, per se you got a conversation with Cameron Crowe I love Say Anything featurette which actually features uh, all comedians including uh, Real Yankovic yep who's always been known for coming up with all these um, music parodies of of all the pop singers out there and stars <laughs> rock stars too yeah it does all these novelty songs so it's great to see him but I wish he was in there more but you also got other comedians like the great Wilson and uh, Mary Ann uh, Shrek I think that's how you say her, her last name I don't know yeah it's sort of a VH1 take on, on, on I love the 70s 80s and 90s and yes even 2000s um, they also have to know Say Anything is to love it trivia track so you be able to watch the movie and be able to see the trivia on how they did it. Uh, you got um, five alternative scenes you know, all the scenes that didn't quite make it into the film or they had to reshot these scenes here and there you got ten deleted scenes once again scenes that almost made it but didn't quite uh, fit in because of you know the running time um, same here 13 extended scenes that you get so you get a lot of great um, deleted alternative and, and extended scenes that you never thought you would see uh, vintage featurettes you know a six minute uh, featurette that they that back in the day before the film came out or after you know, they, they always show you uh, the behind the scenes on how they worked on the film and with the cast and crew doing interviews. Um, theatrical trailers and TV spots included. And a photo gallery. So you got everything here on this wonderful set. <laughs> yep. Even with this uh, cover art, too. Yeah. Um... I saw Say Anything 
Um, I think ever since I was a kid, like, I know this movie came out when I was still three years old, um, going on four, you know, by May 2nd. I mean, this came out uh, in April again. So, I, even by that standard, uh, I didn't see it in theaters. I don't think so. But I know um, I did saw it uh, probably when I think my family rented the film on home, home videos, so I think that's probably where I first saw it. Uh, but I have seen it on TV also, and even on HBO, and I later taped it on the TV as well, so I, I loved it. Um, I thought it was uh, well written, well done, uh, definitely uh, plays it quite different from many of the teen flicks we've seen uh, during the 80s. So. I can see why this was one of the best films uh, ever made uh, by that time. Kind of an interesting point because uh, seeing that this movie came out uh, on the same weekend as She's Out of Control with Tony Danza and uh, Amy Dolan's, yeah, Michael Dolan's uh, daughter, yeah, from the monkeys. <laughs> Which became an iconic uh, Cisco and Ebert episode where Gene was about to act like he wanted to quit his job as a film critic because he saw She's Out of Control, but luckily he went to see Say Anything afterwards and and he changes his mind and his mood, so now he went back to the way he was and continued to go on as a film critic until he died in 1999. And so yeah, if you ever watched the Cisco and Ebert episode, you definitely know how they felt. <laughs> But that's why they love to uh, say anything even more. <laughs> yeah. And I understand too, because I thought She's Out of Control was definitely one of the worst films of, of that year too. I mean, as much as I love Tony Danza from Who's the Boss and Taxi, um, and Amy Dolan's is pretty hot and sexy, you know, even as a young teenager back then, the movie sucks. But I'll say this though, <laughs> I didn't know that Michael Ray Bauer was in the film, and I love the guy, and and they had Dustin Diamond from uh, Saved by the Bell in it, so for that one scene alone, I mean, I'll give you that. <laughs> that was, at least I got to see them for just one scene alone, you know, where Tony Danza's character as the father just chased him down after they spotted uh, his daughter. You know, doing that uh, parody of, of Ten. <laughs> well, whatever. Uh, but anyway, let's uh, get to this review <laughs> with this quote. I gave her her hearts. She gave me a pin. <laughs> Stars John Cusack also been known for being in several teen films and many other films in his entire career. Yeah, such as The Sure Fame, Better Off Dead, and uh, of course films like Gross Point Blank and uh, <laughs> Hot Tough Time Machine, uh, 1408 among others. Ioni Sky, yeah, once again from River's Edge. John Mahoney, you know, who went on to play uh, Dr. Frazier Cranes' his dad on the show Frazier. And sadly he passed away uh, in recent years, but he was definitely a stage actor. But a very good actor. Lily Taylor, who was previously in the film Mystic Pizza, which got Julia Roberts and Annabella Gish their start. <laughs> yeah. She's very good in this. Polly Platt. Uh, Bebe uh, Newworth, also from Frasier, <laughs> which she later went on to do the film Jumanji. The original Jumanji, that is, with Robin Williams. 
uh, Amy Brooks, uh, Loren Dean, who later went on to do the film uh, Billy Bathgate with Dustin Hoffman, Nicole Kidman, and Bruce Willis, if anybody remembers that film. But it was based on a novel. Um, Pamela Segal Adlon, yes, as we all know, <laughs> went on to be went on to do voice acting on many shows, and she's been in movies uh, during and TV shows in the '80s, and she just recently appeared in the film uh, Bumblebee. <laughs> recently, yeah, Shina Phillips who happens to be uh, part of the uh, the vocal group uh, Wilson Phillips who believe it or not was the daughter of a band members of the Mama and the Papas yeah, so she's in the movie also half-sister of Mackenzie Phillips uh, from the TV show um, One Day at a Time the original One Day at a Time uh, One Day at a Time uh, Jeremy Piven also best friends with um, John Cusack and of course because they went on to do um, uh, films together uh, well some films together like for example Ghost Point Blank yeah. Eric Stoltz he was best known for being in the movie called Mask uh, but he was also in films like um, Pulp Fiction uh, Killing Zoe even the, the Fly 2 came out the same year as uh, Say Anything, <laughs> 1989. Yeah. But he was also in the movie uh, The Wildlife, which happens to be written by Cameron Crowe. Uh, Jason Grohl, Philip Baker Hall, from um, several films, he's, from a lot of films he's been in, um, including the movie Sydney. Which would, which is of course, Heart Eight, the the title. Also, Philip Baker Hall was in the movie uh, called um, Three O'clock High. So, I believe he played a cop in that movie. Uh, Joanna Frank, Lola's uh, Chills, Joan Cusack. Yes, Joan Cusack. Uh, Joan Cusack's uh, real life sister. Yeah. Dan Castellaneta, who went on to do the voice of Homer Simpson on The Simpsons. It's, and it's written and directed by Cameron Crowe. The movie begins when we meet a young teenager named Lloyd Dobler, who's played by John Cusack, who falls in love with Diane Quartz, who's played by Ione Skye. Um, just when she was about to make uh, a speech uh, during her high school graduation ceremony. A very important speech that, deep down of it, she is very scared about what the future holds, about what she's going to do in her life. I mean, now that she got a, uh, a scholarship just to go to England, which she actually lives with uh, her divorced father named Jim played by John Mahoney, who actually owns a retirement home that he actually works along with um, Diane. So they're just going around helping elderly people and taking care of them. So Lloyd, on the other hand, lives with his sister named Constance, played by Joan Cusack, who happens to be a single mother, seeing that um, their father is at the army, um, going to Germany, you know, probably for an attack or so. Doesn't explain much, but whatever. Um, Constance also has a, a four-year-old son who happens to be Lloyd's nephew, and not to mention that Lloyd is interested in kickboxing because that's his favorite sport. That's why he teaches a kickboxing class uh, for younger kids. You know, 
preschoolers. But he has no plans for what the future holds except for, you know, doing the kickboxing. So that's when um, Lloyd was trying his best to actually call uh, Diane so that way um, they could fall in love and have a date. So first he has to make a phone call with uh, uh, her father Jim and trying to get uh, the digit from their phone number and then and that way you know he needs to practice this hard hoping that he'll get it right so that's when he decided to call Diane to see if he'll if they'll start to make a date um, on this one particular day and at first she said no but then just as he keeps on talking trying to say everything that he needs to say she said yes and there you go <laughs> so finally um, uh, Diane decided to uh, accompany Lloyd to a graduation party to surprise uh, their classmates together so after they made a phone call which I guess at this rate it is part of a date but at this rate, it might as well just be an actual party. So then Lloyd had a, uh, a dinner, just a dinner conversation at the courthouse where uh, Lloyd suddenly fails to impress uh, Diane's family. Yeah, because you know, he doesn't like to do any of this stuff other than the fact that he wants to go out with Diane. But he does mention that uh, he loves to go do some kickboxing. Either way, even for the conversation, Things were going so well, um, so hoping that the relationship will definitely be alright, I mean, even though it, it was a complicated one, especially when he was giving an advice to uh, Lloyd's uh, folk musician friend named Corey, who's played by Lily Taylor, and yes, she's a girl, which I thought that really interesting because not only did Lloyd actually has, uh, you know, guys as friends, but he also has girls as well. <laughs> so I, I love that. Um, which by the way, Corey um, just never got over her cheating ex-boyfriend named Joe, who's played by Lauren Dean, who actually was one, the one who was responsible to warn him to take care of Diane. Let's see how this will happen. Not to mention the fact that Corey actually written like 63 or 65 songs about Joe. <laughs> So that's when <laughs> Joe just collects all of her music so that way, you know, they'll try to find a way to get back together, but it doesn't seem to work that way. <laughs> of course. So anyway, but as time's gone by, I mean especially what's going on with Jim since he's being informed under investigation by the IRS because it turns out that he definitely has a secret life that just backfires so he, so he knows that he's in trouble he starts to feel very guilty about, about what's happening that having to deal with what's going on uh, Jim decided to have Diane um, urge to to, ha to make a breakup with Lori by actually because he, he felt jealous at first, but I think at this point on, they're not working out at this point. And plus, you know, Diane's about to leave to England pretty soon. I mean, he felt that it wasn't the appropriate match together, and they decided, he suggested that she should give um, Lloyd a pen as a souvenir. Um, she didn't want to do that. I mean, she wants to, like, stay with uh, Lloyd. You know, after they started falling in love with each other, you know, just you know, making love inside his car, you know, when they went to the, the beach <laughs> and just sweating. I mean, this is where it gets complicated and very difficult because when Diane tells Lloyd that she wants to stop seeing him for a while, just so she can concentrate with her studies and all this and that she's going to go over there. 
tells him to take the, her pen so that way he'll write to her in case everything gets better. But he felt so devastated that he felt heartbroken that, yep, it looks to me like this whole thing was a breakup, as it seems. So Lloyd tries to seek more advice from Corey, who tells him to actually be a man. It only gets worse because that's when Jim's credit cards, just when he was planning to buy some, you know, packing bags for Diane so she can go on the trip, they um, they declined. So now we know he really is in big trouble, for sure. So, so he couldn't buy it. But during that one particular morning. Uh, Lloyd suddenly, uh, as we saw in, the, in this iconic scene here, that's on the cover of this Blu-ray, he holds up uh, the boombox playing the song In Your Eyes by Peter Gabriel, <laughs> hoping that he'll never give up on her. Because no matter how hard he tries, you know, he wants to be with her for the rest of his life. Because that was the song that they played when they slept together, especially at the beach. So he actually does that uh, on her open bedroom window while she was sleeping with her PJs on. That follows the next day when Diane suddenly meets an IRS investigator who's played by Philip Baker Hall, who explains that he might have evidence suggesting that Jim has been get this, embezzling uh, from his retirement home residence around. As he's stealing all that money. Yeah, that's where she found out um, inside that Pandora box. So now she couldn't trust him anymore. Decided not to speak with Jim anymore because he felt like, you know, he's he's trusting a traitor. So that's when Jim decided that he needs to face the music and say to go straight to them to court, try to turn himself in, and got arrested. So he went to jail. So now, Diane decided to go back to uh, Lloyd, just when he was uh, doing his uh, kickboxing uh, practice. Yeah, causing him a broken nose, but it actually put together. His nose was bleeding. She decided to get back together with him, making up all the mistakes that she made and found out about what happened. So. Now it was up to Lloyd and Diane to actually go straight to um, England on a trip. But first they had to go uh, back to the prison so that way they can give uh, Jim the letter so to explain about all this. And then later Diane had to go up to him and have him, uh, by giving him his pen, back and decided to write uh, a message for Diane so that way things will turn, up, turn out for the better for, for her and, and hoping it will be a fresh start. But here's another note here is that Diane is afraid of, uh, of flying <laughs> on an airplane so that's when the Lloyd decided to help her out. There you go. <laughs> At the end. Yeah, um, I really love this film. Once again, <laughs> and it really holds up. I mean, this really shows. I mean, about the the relationship that they're going about and having to deal with honesty and dishonesty that's happening um, all around us. I mean, the movie definitely feels real, no doubt about it. I mean, this is not your typical um, teenage uh, comedy and drama that you often see these days. 
or any other like sex comedies that we often see. No, this is actually um, it's more like a real life story where you know teenagers and and parents you know have their own problems and they have to face it. I mean, they're not the winners, but no matter what they do, they're you know going to fight hard and they're going to try to find a way you know to fix this problem. And that's what it that's what it is. Um, but deep down of it, I, I do love the chemistry between Cusack and Sky, and it really shows that it really worked. I mean, even with all the memorable dialogue that they were given, because they had to say anything <laughs> to each other, or say anything to everyone, or whatever, <laughs> but what they do. You know, it's like, I mean, they knew they were meant to be together. So. Even if uh, if Diane had to confront with uh, her overprotective father, who had to deal with his problems, considering that you know he's, he owns a retirement home, just trying to help all the uh, old people around. Yeah, and I and speaking of which, though, I mean. This is going to sound a little off topic, but when it got to the scene of the retirement home, they went inside to one of the rooms inside. There was an old lady that has uh, tan skin, which I'm shocked to believe, but that old lady looks a little bit like Auntie. My Auntie. Yeah. Yeah, Bertha Neri. And I was like, oh my god. I missed her so much that I just couldn't believe I actually spotted one that looks exactly like her. Yeah. And to think, though, I mean, she was uh, in her 50s at the time when this movie came out. And I figured she was going to look like that uh, in her old age, and she did. Yeah, I'm sorry I had to mention it, but I just thought it'd be a... I just couldn't believe I saw it, and I felt like, oh man, I was ready to cry. Um, but anyway, there were a lot of good moments on in the movie, too. Like, for example, uh, Aloy was teaching uh, Diane how to drive um, with her car, her father's car, and... You know, driving all, all the way around in circles at the retirement home. Or, um, I also love the other moments too when the <laughs> when they were at the party, you know, a graduation party, and he becomes the key master. So he's like collecting all the keys because his friend uh, Valerie, who now dresses up as a rooster. <laughs> With the number uh, of the year 88, because it's the class of 88. <laughs> They're all just jumping on him. Uh, I remember that scene <laughs> where uh, his other friend um, named Mark, who's played by Jeremy Piven, he just <laughs> he keeps uh, jumping on him, and you know he's like yelling, screaming, and <laughs> I remember that one scene where. By the, by the end of the party, he just jumps on him, like having a fight, telling them, Where's my uh, fireproof keys? <laughs> and, his, and then he says, You gotta chill! I'm gonna find your keys! <laughs> oh, that's just hilarious. Or any other. Oh, boy. <laughs> so, yeah, there, there was even co um, comedy moments in those scenes as well. Or... Or even the conversation um, with Diane's uh, family, including the Jim, you know, Diane's father. I mean, like he had to explain what he wants to do in the future, but he doesn't want to buy anything, sell anything, or process anything. You know, he just he's just more interested in kickboxing. That's <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. Um, 
but nevertheless, um, uh, but back to the cast, uh, John Cusack was just fun, um, he was wonderful in this movie, and definitely uh, the right choice to play an optimistic, uh, over underachiever type of guy, who's nervous, shy, but at times he's, he's also athletic, as you can see, you know, he, does all these uh, kickboxing moves, and I love that. I mean, he even teaches uh, his uh, four-year-old nephew how to do all that. I thought that was cool. You know, punching on those these uh, body bags, punch, doing all these uh, punching bags and kicking them. Love that. Even the the moment with uh, his sister, yeah, Constance, and it's almost like I'm seeing the real life Cusacks together, just. Uh, yeah, doing what they're doing, you know, you know, hanging around, uh, taking care of the place, all, all of that. Ione Sky, no doubt about it, she was totally drop dip gorgeous, or and very beautiful, very smart, intelligent too. I mean, I love her lovely blue eyes and and her lovely smile too. I mean. Who wouldn't want to fall in love with her? <laughs> yeah. And John, Mah John Mahoney was uh, just an excellent s stage actor, you know, playing Jim. And the way he plays the character, I mean, he comes across as a very nice, caring father, as you could tell. And he's very, he definitely cares for, for all the elderly people around, even though he has a lot of flaws in his life. I mean, he felt so guilty about it that all this pain is not going to go away. But no doubt about it, I mean, in spite of his troubles, I mean, you know, she does care for her father. No doubt about it. Uh, Lily Taylor was also uh, very good in this, too, um, as Lloyd's friend, Corey. And, and I gotta say, she <laughs> does a very good job just singing all the songs about uh, her ex-boyfriend and <laughs> yeah and you can even tell how talented she really was and plus I guess even for her advice I mean sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't at this rate <laughs> her advice wasn't really <laughs> anything special well who knows <laughs> but no matter what which, but nevertheless I mean Corey does a, a good advice but Corey's trying to do her best to help him out, as opposed to uh, Joe and the rest of his friends. Uh, yes, uh, there's even moments here where after he broke up, uh, after he got broken hearted by Diane, that he winds up um, driving around in his car, you know, talking to himself on the tape recorder, trying to explain about his feelings. And then he goes up to his uh, best friends, you know, just trying to find someone who's just like Diane. You know. And then <laughs> he suddenly, uh, so they were stuck inside a gas station. You know, they, you know, one of them is eating uh, Funyuns, uh, onion rings, uh, chips, and you know, he was drinking. And then he actually threw up a, a glass bottle onto the. Uh, <laughs> The dumpster <laughs> almost hit the guys, but then they started doing a rap later on. <laughs> I thought, wow, that was pretty class. Oh, and don't forget uh, another moment, you know, by the time um, they're about to take, um, yeah, one friend who actually dresses up like, uh, like the singer uh, Simply Red, <laughs> who happens to be the son of Barbara Streisand, you know, the, the actor. Um, so, uh, yeah, they're about to take him back home while they're listening to rock on the radio. So, both Lloyd and, and Diane hang out together by going to walk around, going to 7-Eleven, get some drinks, and then it was very nice that he actually uh, moved away all that glass, broken glass, uh, on the parking lot, you know, just so 
you can let uh, Diane walk by. And I thought that was really sweet. Something you, you never see <laughs> in movies. Kind of like how, you know, people like to put in uh, a t-shirt just to cover that puddle on the <laughs> on the corner and, the and let everyone walk by so they don't fall or hurt themselves, but then one of them just slips, you know, that sort of thing. So she didn't want to get caught. Uh, like, she doesn't want to get all, all these glass cuts uh, on her foot. So that's true. Yeah, she might trip. So that's very nice. And he does all these awkward uh, <laughs> moves, you know, outside while well, after she he took uh, Diane home to her father. Really cool. Also, Cameron Crowe did a wonderful job, uh, not only writing the script, because this was actually based on his real life uh, story, believe it or not, that it actually works on screen. And the fact that he did a uh, wonderful job directing this film uh, with the help of James L. Brooks, the executive producer of Gracie Films, yeah, the man that gave us uh, all these TV shows like Taxi, you know, The Simpsons, The Tracy Ullman Show, all come to mind. Also worked on the movie Big, you know, Broadcast News, and even The Work Working Girl, <laughs> yeah. uh, along with Richard Sakai. works well together. I mean, they, they, they really come up with the achievement of writing some witty dialogue and um, a lot of memorable quotes and everything. I mean, even though this was his first directorial debut, I mean, he must have had a hard time trying to put everything together, but I guess even the actors started to help him out too, in a way. And no doubt about it, it's also my favorite John Cusack uh, performance and also my favorite film of his next to Better Off Dead, One Crazy Summer, <laughs> uh, The Sure Fane, yeah, by director Rob Reiner, and of course, Gross Point Blank, uh, and Hub Tut Time Machine, <laughs> even 1408. Yeah, all those, all those movies. And of course, I even love uh, The Grifters, and, and of course, Sixteen Candles. Yeah. <laughs> Money or Nothing, or whatever. But my least favorite is 2012, uh, Cell, War Inc., all come to mind. Yeah. And I also love the movie... <laughs> Grand Piano, too. That's another good movie uh, that he did. Yeah. Uh, anyway. <laughs> yeah, I know, I talk too much. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> I had to say anything, okay? But, nevertheless, um, out of all the films out there, this is indeed... Uh, one of the best romantic comedy and dramas uh, and definitely iconic, no doubt about it. And you can never go wrong with say anything. <laughs> and that's the truth. So that's the movie, Say Anything, and I give the movie what else? Five stars. <laughs> yeah, five stars hanging up up in the air on the boom box and doing all these uh, <laughs> some interesting angles you know like holding the boom box in that one side or the other <laughs> that's where we're I'm Joseph A. Sabora and I'll see you later bye